Uh, I want to begin this morning with, um, with this quote by Bill Cosby. He says, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. And uh, I've thought about that quote, and um, I think I know the reality of that quite well. It was about eight years ago, this time of the year, where I was dealing with failure. Um, I had attempted to do what Bill Cosby here kind of warns against, to, uh, to try to please others. And I did my best to try to make people happy. Um, I tried very hard to meet expectations that other people had. And at the same time, I was doing my best to protect myself from being criticized. And like the quote predicts, uh, I failed at that. Uh, that experience was painful. It was painful for me personally, but it was also painful for my family. And it also affected others around me. And what's ironic is that I failed because I was trying to avoid failure. Um, but personally, not at the time, but looking back, personally, it became one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I'll share more about that later. So this morning, I continue with my focus on myth. And um, myth as a widely held but false belief or idea. And as I explained last Sunday, that our beliefs, whether they're true or false, they shape our values, they shape our attitudes, and they shape our behaviors. And as a result, if we uh, have bought into uh, a myth, that can have some significant implications. It's important that we become aware of that, and if possible, correct those false beliefs that we have. Now, these false beliefs can be about areas of faith, Maybe it's a false belief about what we imagine God is like. Uh, those false beliefs can be about other people. As we experience other people, certain assumptions we make about them that might be wrong. And those false beliefs can even be about ourselves. Messages that we've heard and that we've come to believe about ourselves that may not be true. And when that happens, it limits our freedom and it prevents us from becoming the person that we're meant to be. This morning, I will focus on this myth, that failure is bad. Huh, some of you are thinking, what, that's a myth? And big F on that piece of paper up there? What I tend to do as I begin my messages, I, I try to look up definitions of words. So I looked up the definition of failure, and here are some of the things that I found. Not Achieving a desired outcome, falling short, not being successful at something, not measuring up to other standards, making mistakes. And in religious terminology, we might even call a failure a sin. Now, I think most of us can relate to wanting to avoid failure probably at any cost. Why? because there's this notion in our world that in order to be successful in life, we have to avoid making mistakes. Failure, on the other hand, exposes our imperfections, our weaknesses, our limitations. Uh, Michael Gilbert, an author of uh, Three Stories of Trust and Authenticity, says this. He says, our relationship to failure is a powerful force tied in with approval, shame, love, and even our sense of survival. Ultimately, our ego is behind our efforts to avoid failure. It's that part of us that makes us feel important and valued and significant. Because our ego wants us to appear competent, successful, and worthy of people's admiration and respect. When we do fail, it feels like an attack, an attack on our significance and security as a person. 
And depending on the failure, the nature of that failure, whatever that might be, there are small failures and there are great massive failures in life. Depending on that, we can experience a whole range of emotions. Here are some that I listed. Frustration, disappointment, anxiety, shame, anger, guilt, shock. Now, these feelings might even lead to hopelessness and even depression. Searching online for some graphics that I'm using this morning, I even came across a couple of interesting websites. I don't know if interesting is the right word, but here, here is the title of two of them. The first one is, I am a complete failure. The other one was, I fail at life. And trust me, it's very depressing reading when you read some of the posts that people have written on there. So unfortunately, failure for some becomes so traumatic that it causes them to harm themselves. And sometimes they even harm other people. And again, depending on the nature of our failure, family and friends of ours are affected by that as well. They too might experience some of the emotions that we experience. Scripture speaks about failure. And, um, and one of the affirmations in Scripture is this, we all fail. James 3.2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Paul reminds us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of what God expects. If you read about the life of Jesus, in a period that's coming up very soon, the Passion Week, we know that even those who were closest to Jesus, those who swore to always stick by him, all of them failed Jesus when he needed them most, when he was left all alone. So no wonder that we, uh, many believe that failure is bad. How can it not be? I also found this quote online. It says, Failure is just a word, you give it the definition. Now I have to tell you that first half of that quote, I think is just a bunch of positive thinking, what's the word? Junk. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, maybe if your failure is, you know, instead of getting an A, you got a B on an exam, maybe. But some of us have experienced failure in life, and some of us are in the middle of failure. And it's not just a word. It's not just a state of mind. Failure is much more than that. But the second part of that quote, there's something true about that. And I was, as I was reflecting on it, it reminded me of another myth that I probably won't get to this time around. That myth is conflict is bad. Now, I really don't believe that that is true, that conflict is bad. But I think we almost try to avoid conflict almost as much as we try to avoid failure. Not quite, but almost as much. Conflict, I believe, in and of itself is neutral. Conflict just happens. Now, it is how we respond to conflict and how we respond to those who are associated with the conflict determines whether or not it becomes positive or negative whether or not it's an opportunity for deeper understanding, maybe even deeper intimacy, or if it becomes an opportunity for greater division and a whole range of violence, not just between people, but between nations. Now, failure, I think, in that respect is inev inevitable as well. None of us is perfect. We all are going to fail in some way. And I think it offers a similar opportunity for good or for harm. Here are some, some examples, I think, of when failure becomes harmful. Failure becomes harmful when, first of all, we blame others for our failure. When we point the finger at other people and say, you're the reason why I failed. Now, I'm not suggesting that just because uh, people are involved, that that makes them innocent. 
But I think when we point our finger at another person and blame them for our failure, it really hinders our ability to learn about what role did we have in this? What lessons might we learn? You see, just like with conflict, when there's a failure, that particular incident, whatever the failure is, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But there's a whole other world underneath that. Failure becomes harmful when we ignore our failure and immediately move on to the next thing. Now again, that might be okay with something minor, but if it's a significant failure, you know, I've known people that were in a relationship, that relationship failed, and immediately they were looking for somebody else. That kind of response is a type of avoidance, where first of all, we don't really even process what happens to us emotionally. It's a way of covering up the feelings, whatever those feelings and emotions might be. Failure becomes harmful when we label ourselves or others a failure. Some dictionaries define failure as a person that fails. So if a person fails, that means they're a failure, according to that definition. I don't believe that. I don't believe that just because we fail at something, that means that we are a failure. That doesn't line up with my understanding of who we are as human beings. That doesn't line up with my understanding of scripture. We are not our failures. Yes, we fail. Yes, our failures might have consequences for us and for people around us, but we do not become our failures. You see, there's this tension between honestly acknowledging the, the, the feelings and, and the consequences of our failure, while at the same time recognizing the opportunity that we might be able to grow from that experience. When things happen to us and we label them as bad, what are the questions we begin to ask often? Why? Why me? Why now? God, why did you let this happen? What if we change that question around a little bit when we experience failure in life? What if we ask instead, God, what do you have for me here? What do you have for me here? What if you viewed our failure as an opportunity? What if you viewed it as a key that could open up and reveal something hidden, hidden from us, hidden from our awareness, hidden from our understanding, that could add truth and meaning and even a greater purpose to our lives? What purpose might failure have? What value can failure have in our lives? Here are some possibilities. I don't know if I'll convince you, but here are some possibilities. Failure, first of all, can allow us to learn from our mistakes. Maybe our assumptions were wrong. Maybe our approach. Maybe it was our attitude. Failure can become for us a lesson that allows us to grow and develop as human beings. Maybe a failure exposes an attitude within us. Maybe a failure, particularly in relationships, I, I, I remember this, this one gentleman he talked about different relationships he was in, and none of them worked. And he had this excuse for that relationship, and this excuse for that relationship. And after about three or four times, I asked him, I said, you know, what is the common denominator in all of these relationships of yours? And he realized, uh, me. I said, ah. I said, you think, you think it might be possible that you might have something to do with, maybe even just a little bit, with all of these relationships going wrong. Failure is one way, for some of us, it might be the only way for us to gain an awareness of something that we need to come to terms with, to understand about ourselves. This is what happened in my case, with my failure. I began to realize that I was trying to please people, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, Tom, why were you trying to please people? What were you trying to avoid? How, why, what made you do that? 
And as I begin to explore that, I, I begin to gain a deeper insight about myself. Here's another possibility. Failure can expose our need for other people. In my case, when I experienced my, fa my failure, I had the support of my family. But I'll be honest with you, that wasn't enough. Because first of all, my family was trying to deal with the failure as well. But I needed to help the aid of a skilled healer. I, made, I started seeing a psychologist to begin to help me to make sense of what I was going through. So significant issues were brought to light as a result of my failure. Some of us need that kind of experience, that kind of crisis, that kind of failure to make us realize that we need other people in our lives. Brothers and sisters, there are no lone rangers, no superheroes in the body of Christ. There aren't any. We each have a part to play. We each have a function in the body of Christ. And I think in one time or another, we need that, that touch. We need that word. We need that hug. We need that truth spoken into our lives to help us. We can't do it on our own. Failure sometimes makes us aware of our need for other people in our lives. God can use failure to transform our character. Failure, I believe, is an effective, if painful, treatment for things like pride, arrogance, a judgmental spirit. There's nothing like failure to begin to address that and to transform that into humility and compassion and gentleness things that we are to exhibit as followers of Christ. And finally, God can use failure to change the direction of our life. Maybe that's the only way that could happen. We, ha we fail in something. It might be in a vocation. It might be in a relationship. And it will take that failure to, for God to redirect our lives. Someone once said that we grow spiritually much more by doing it wrong than by doing it right. Think about that. We grow much more spiritually by doing it wrong than by doing it right. There's a part of us that doesn't want to believe that because we want to do it right. We want to avoid failure. But if you're always right, if everything's going smoothly, how are you ever going to change? How are you ever going to grow? How are you going to become more than what you are? Failure, even if it's painful, even if it's scary, can become a wonderful gift if we do not view failure as inherently bad and instead focus on opportunities for growth and for learning. By the way, as I was thinking about this, it struck me I do not believe that we are our failures. The flip side also is true. I do not believe that we are our successes either. You see, this notion can creep in that, uh, you know, I'm successful because I made it happen. Or I'm successful because God is blessing me for my obedience, for me being a good person. I think that can be more harmful than any failure any of us could have, that kind of notion. And if you read your Bible, if you read the life of Christ, who is he upset with? Is he upset with sinners? Is he upset with people who fail? Never. You never see that. But who is he upset with? He's upset with people who are arrogant, self-righteous, and judgmental. People who don't fail. Those are the people that Jesus is upset with. Which brings me to the look at failure in the context of our faith and our relationship with God. Earlier I was making the point that all of us fail, and I quoted Paul in Romans 3.23 when he said, For all have sinned and fall short of what God expects. This is what Paul writes next. And yet God accepts us freely by his grace. You see, you and I might fail, but that doesn't matter to God. 
He accepts us freely because of grace. Later, Paul writes that we are made right with God, not by anything that we have done, but through his grace. You know, we're not right with God because we lead moral, upstanding lives. We are right with God because of his grace, because of something that we could have nothing to do with. We are saved not by our own works, but by the grace of God alone. Later on, Paul writes this, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. What did you do to save yourself? Nothing. It was grace. And that's how we continue to live our life. Live out our faith every day by grace. So when we fail, there is grace. And there's opportunities to learn and to grow. In yet another letter to the young church, Paul writes these words, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, and I would include failures. For when I am weak through Christ, then I am strong. You see, I believe what allows us to transform painful failure into opportunities for growth and new possibilities is the knowledge of God's unconditional love and his grace towards us. No failure of yours or of mine will ever shock God, will ever surprise God, will ever cause God to love you any less because his love never fails. My own failure eight years ago was very difficult and painful and at times perplexing. Now, at the time I was meeting with my own spiritual director, and I remember as I was going through this, we were meeting one day and he said, Tom, I want to say something to you. And you might resent me for it. You're probably not going to believe it, but I'm going to tell you. This painful time that you're going through, it's a gift. And I said, can I give it back? <laughs> but you know, he's a godly man. Already then he was in his early 80s. He's a wise man. And he was true. His words were true. It was a gift. It did become a gift. Out of that painful failure came a better understanding of who I was. My strengths, my weaknesses, my gifts, my passions. Out of that came a more realistic awareness about my role and my responsibilities, my vocation. And out of that came a more mature relationship with God, one less built on wishful thinking than on reality and truth. It wasn't easy, but failure was not bad. It became a gift. And I want to encourage you with this. Whatever failure you have experienced, whatever failure you are experiencing, it does not have to be bad. It can become a gift for you as well. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we are so conditioned at times to think that when we fail, that we've done bad, that we've messed up. Lord, whether that comes from our society, whether that message comes from our culture, Lord, uh, help us to realize that failure is inevitable. It will happen to all of us. Big failures, small failures, and everything in between. Lord, before we begin to beat ourselves up or point the finger at others and blame them, Lord, help us to become still. And maybe ask the question, God, what is it that you have for me here? Lord, what do I need to understand, whether that's about me or about you? Is there a message here for me? But God, the most encouraging thing I want to pray for all of us is that we remember you hold us and our failures in your hands of love and grace. 
and you never let us go. Amen.